Father God, we pray now that you would open up our ears to hear your words and that we would hear your words in our own hearts. God, that you would teach us what it really means and what these scriptures are telling us about the power of our words and that you would set aflame our desire to speak words of truth and speak words of life and to sow seeds that are good in the places that are around us. So this morning, Father, speak to us that we might speak that word to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in a series called War of the Words and it's all about that struggle that goes on inside all of us about what words we're going to use on a daily basis. The struggle that you feel in your chest about what words you're going to speak in is this battle often between what you want to say and what you should say. Have you ever felt that tension before inside of you between the words that are on the tip of your tongue and the words that you know you should say in a situation like this, even if it's nothing at all? And the truth is there's actually a war that's going on inside of us every single day about what words we are going to speak to the people around us and the situations that are going on around us. And last week, one of the things that we learned, one of the first things we learned is that words are seeds. Do you remember that from last week? Words are seeds, seeds that have the God-given power of life or death. And every single day when you and I are talking with our friends and when we're talking with our families, we are digging our hand into one of two buckets. We are either digging our hand into the seeds of life and scattering them around our lives, or we are digging our hands into the seeds of death and scattering around the same places and the same relationships that we spend our every day in together. We're scattering these seeds around our marriage. We're scattering them around our friendships. We're scattering them around our kids and our family and our workplace and everywhere we go. And you see, the question isn't whether or not we are sowing seed. The question is what kind of seed you are sowing. Amen, church? The question isn't whether you are sowing because sowing is not something you have any control over. The question isn't whether or not you are sowing. The question is what kind of seed are you sowing in your own heart, in your own life, and in the people around you? And if you missed last week, I just want to encourage you to go online and watch it because what we're going to talk about today is going to make a whole lot more sense after you have seen that. Words are absolutely incredibly powerful. The words that you speak and the words that I speak have immense power in the situations and the relationships around us. And my prayer for us in this series is simply this, is that, is that God would teach us how to speak. Do you want God to teach you how to speak? Then pray that prayer in the morning. Pray, God, teach me how to speak. Today we're actually going to talk about emotions. We're going to talk about one emotion in particular. And the reason why we're going to talk about emotions is because sometimes you need to talk about your heart before you talk about your mouth. Jesus says that out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. He says this in Matthew 12. And what he's really saying by all of this is what, st- what happens here doesn't start here. What happens here actually starts here. You see, what comes out of here doesn't genesis here. It doesn't begin here. Whatever starts here actually began somewhere far deeper inside you. It began in your heart. And that's why Jesus says, out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks, because the words that come out of your mouth eventually have begun their journey from inside your heart. So if you want to get a hold on your tongue, you need to get a hold on your heart. If you want to control what you say, if you want to have a command and mastery of the words that come out of your mouth, you need to have control over what happens in your heart. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're actually going to talk about one emotion in particular. It's the emotion of anger. Anybody ever felt anger in this room before? Yeah, everybody has felt this before. We're not just going to talk about the emotion of anger. We're actually going to talk about words that grow and that flow from this experience of the emotion of anger. Now, I was reading a funny story this week about an elderly couple, and this husband and wife were sitting down. They were old and gray, well in their 80s. They were sitting down one night by the fire, and they were just thinking back to all the fights that they had had through the years. I'm sure you guys have never had fights with your spouses. This is an unusual couple, of course. And so she's sitting there. The wife is sitting there. She's thinking about all of these fights they've had through the years. She's playing them over and over in her head, and she just stopped at one moment, and she looked at her husband, and she just said, honey... Honey, I'm so sorry I've blown up at you so many times over the years. I really am. How did you manage to stay so calm? And her husband looked back at her and he says, you know what, it was it's really easy. And she's having a little trouble believing him. So she said, how could that have been easy? It really wasn't? And he said, yeah, after you would blow up with me, I would just go and clean the toilet. And she would say, and that, that actually helped you? And he would say, oh, yes, because every time I cleaned the toilet, I used your toothbrush. See, 
See, I always wondered where Mel went after we had a fight. She would always disappear for a little while. I never really knew where it was that she was going. And then when I went to the bathroom, it was just sparkling clean. This is not a true story, by the way. You can relax just a little bit. It's not a true story. But it's a story that reminds us of a simple reality. And the simple reality is this, is that anger is a powerful emotion, isn't it, church? Anger can make you do some remarkably crazy things, and it can even do these things with people that you love and that you care about. And sometimes anger is the genesis of the harshest things that you have ever said in your life. And I think you, I think you know this. You've all experienced this in some way, shape, or form. Anger can make you do some crazy things. And in some way, shape, or form, every one of us in this room and every human being on planet Earth has felt or dealt with this emotion that we call anger. Now, we don't all experience it the same way, and we sure don't all deal with it the same way, but the truth is we all know what it's like to feel agitated. We all know what it's like to feel upset, and we all know what it's like, whether we realize it or not, to feel angry. And you know what? Of all the words that you have spoken in your life that you wish that you could somehow take back, of all the words that you have spoken that if you could give any sum of money to pull them back and put them back in your pocket, I am willing to bet that a vast majority of those words grew out of some sense of frustration and some sense of anger inside of you. I'm willing to bet that even though there may have been a cocktail of emotions in that moment, if you were to dig down deep enough and peel back all of the layers, if you could get to the root of what caused those words to come out of your mouth, the root would have somewhere anger near the root. Maybe in that moment there was a lot going on, but somewhere anger was lurking. Now, if you're listening to me this morning and thinking, oh, this sermon is about anger, so I don't really have to worry about listening for the rest of it because I don't really struggle with anger. I don't get angry. I get frustrated. I get irritated. I get agitated, but I don't get angry. If that's you, I just want to encourage you to hang with me for the rest of this morning. Because those words that I just said, frustrated, irritated, and agitated, those synonyms for anger are usually the ones we use when we don't like how the word anger sounds. How many of you know Andy Stanley? He's a pastor of a big church in the States. Andy Stanley was in counseling once with a counselor, and maybe that surprises you that a pastor would need counseling, but I promise you, we do. Thank you for not saying amen there. I promise you that... As many people as could use someone to talk to, pastors could absolutely sometimes more than anyone else use someone to talk to. And he was sitting with a counselor there and he was talking to him. And his counselor asked him, why are you so angry, Andy? And Andy said, I'm not angry. I'm just frustrated. I'm not really angry. I'm just a little bit frustrated. And his counselor looked at him. He said, Andy, I think you're angry. And he said, I'm not angry. I'm just frustrated. And his counselor said, what's the difference? Okay, you tell me what the difference is. And Andy sat there for a second and then for a second longer and he says, it sounds better. Right? Frustrated sounds better than angry. Agitated sounds better than angry. Irritated sounds better than angry. But if you were to list the symptoms of each of these conditions and emotions, they are almost a carbon copy of one another. They are just in varying degrees. So if in your head you're thinking, this is not a sermon I need to listen to, please hang with me because the truth is every one of us wrestles with anger. Every one of us has felt or experienced this emotion at some point and we don't all deal with it the same way. By my count, there are three ways that human beings deal with anger. This is just my own observation. They do one of three things. They either explode, they implode, or they go ice cold usually respond to anger in one of three ways. We explode, we implode, or we go ice cold. Some of us, when we feel anger, especially when we feel it strongly, it's like pressure that's building inside of a bottle, and that pressure builds and builds and builds until one day it comes rushing out. And when that anger comes rushing out, there is usually a path of destruction in its wake, and usually the trigger for that emotion was not even that big deal at all. But that anger and that pressure came rushing out in that one moment, and for them, that anger exploded, and someone else pays the price for it. Some people explode when they are pushed to the limit. Other people, and these are a lot harder to spot, some of you, maybe you implode when you feel anger on a deep level. Instead of that same pressure that builds inside of you coming out, do you know where it goes? It goes in. And the people that implode that same amount of pressure, that same amount of destructive force, instead of coming out here, it goes in here, and they pay the price for it themselves. They implode, and they are so much harder to spot. But you know what? There's actually one more category, and it's one that I'm more familiar with than the rest of them, and this is when people go ice cold. Do you know anybody that goes ice cold when they get angry? 
Do you know anybody that shuts down and frosts right up when they can't express this emotion that's going on inside of them? I remember my first quote-unquote fight with my wife, and I I say quote-unquote fight because if you were watching from a distance, you would have no idea that we were fighting. You ever been in one of these fights before? If you were to watch from a distance, you would have no idea that there was anything wrong whatsoever. Everything looked fine. Nobody was yelling. Nobody had big hand gestures. Nobody was slamming doors. And if you were to watch from the outside, you couldn't see anything happening, but boy, you could feel it. Let me tell you, you could feel it. It felt like an ice age had just settled in around me. When she and I were talking, I could almost see the breath coming out of my mouth. Because things had gone ice cold. Now each of these reactions, regardless of how you react, the same emotion is driving these reactions. And what is that emotion? That emotion is anger. Whether you explode, whether you implode, or whether you go ice cold, we're all reacting to the same thing. And it's why it's so important that we know what we're dealing with. Now, the Bible actually talks a bunch about anger. It talks a lot about this emotion that we're talking about this morning that we all feel from time to time. And and what it says just might surprise you. You see, so many people assume that the Bible is all about these high-flying spiritual truths, this ethereal heavenly reality. But the truth is, if you were to actually read the Bible, you would find so many times that you would open it up and you would go, that is exactly what I am dealing with right now. Have you had that experience before? You open up the Bible and and you're just in your devotions in the morning, and you realize that this is exactly what I am dealing with this morning. Because the Bible is full of real wisdom for real-life situations, exactly like the one we're talking about today, like when you deal with anger. So I want to read with you words that Paul wrote many years ago that are just as true today as the day he penned them. It's from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 32. You can see them on the screen and follow along if you like. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something useful to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen." And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ had forgiven you. Now, whenever I think of anger, whenever I actually think about emotion in general, this is the very first passage that I come to. This is the very first place I turn in my Bibles when I'm thinking about this idea of anger. And the reason why it means so much to me is that this gives me, this verse gives me not just a theology of anger, it gives me a theology of emotion altogether. This set of verses doesn't just give me a way of understanding anger, it gives me a way as a follower of Jesus of understanding all emotions altogether. And here this is what Paul says, he says, in your anger do not sin. In your anger do not sin. Now this passage is just as important about what it doesn't say as what it does say. It does not say if you get angry. Do any of your translations say if you get angry? It doesn't say if you get angry, do not sin. It does not say if you get frustrated, don't sin. It says when you get angry, when you get frustrated, when you get agitated, this is Paul's advice to you. Make sure it doesn't lead you into sin. When you get worked up, make sure it doesn't lead you and turn into sin. Now, I remember years ago, the first time I ever read this, this was a real light bulb moment for me. This was an absolute revelation because in that moment when I read this, I realized something critical for my own walk with Jesus, and this is what it was. Emotions themselves are not wrong. Emotions themselves are not sin. It's all about what you do with it. Are you tracking with me on that? Emotions themselves are not wrong. Emotions themselves are not sin. It is all about what you do with it next. It is all about what you speak next. It is all about what you do next. It is all about how you react next. Emotions themselves are not sin. It is all about what you do with them. And for me, this was an absolute revelation because I realized that emotions are just emotions. Emotions are just these automatic responses that you and I have because we're people, we're human beings to situations that are out of our control, usually. And a lot of us, maybe you in this room, were raised to think that certain emotions good Christians and good followers of Jesus don't feel. 
Maybe you were told that anger is an emotion that a good follower of Jesus doesn't struggle with, and I'm here to tell you this morning that that's simply not true because Paul struggled, didn't struggle with it. Paul experienced it. Jesus experienced it, and God himself has experienced it. So if those people have experienced this emotion, it cannot be wrong. Are you with me? Emotions themselves are not wrong. It is all about what you do with them. You see, here Paul doesn't say, don't feel anger. What he says is, when you get angry, when you are agitated, when somebody makes life difficult and miserable for you, he says, in your anger, don't let it turn into sin. And for me, this was a critical distinction. Because instead of wasting my time trying not to feel something, instead I can be honest about how I feel and faithful what I do with it. Instead of wasting my energy and trying not to feel, have you ever tried not to feel an emotion before? Have you ever just told yourself, don't feel that? Did that work for you? It didn't work for me. I've tried it a hundred times. Instead of wasting my time trying not to feel something, I can be honest about how I feel, but then I can be faithful what I do with it. For me, this was such a freeing thought. It was such a revelation, and I hope, I hope it's a freeing thought for you this morning, too. If you actually read verse 26 in Greek, it's even stronger than any of our English translations other than the ESV translate. The Greek word for anger is in the imperative sense, and what that means is this is actually a command, and if you were to directly translate this passage, this is what it would say. It would say, be angry and do not sin. Isn't that interesting? Be angry. There are some situations in which you are going to be angry. There are even some situations in which you should be angry. When you see evil, when you see injustice, when you see sin wreck and destroy someone's life, there is nothing wrong with that emotion that comes out of you and you say, this is wrong and I don't like it. There are even some situations in which you should be angry, but here is the critical distinction and Paul says it all in the same sentence. He says this, in your anger, when you get angry, it is so incredibly important that when you feel this emotion, you do not let it lead you into sin. You don't let it drag you off into a place that you don't want to go. You don't let it make you speak something or say something or do something that you would not normally have done in your anger. Don't let it turn into sin. And here's why this verse is underlined, sometimes double underlined in my Bible, is that in six words, God gives us three incredible realizations. It gives you a theology of emotion. It clarifies for you what you can control and what you cannot control. And it teaches the importance of controlling what you respond to next. All in six words. In your anger, do not sin. Now, I remember learning this the hard way last year. I came home one day, and for whatever reason, I was upset and I was worked up about something. And not too long after I got home, my lovely wife took the brunt of it. I hate to admit it, but I just took my frustration and I handed it off to her. Have you ever done that before? They say that misery loves company and so does frustration and so does anger. So I took my frustration and I basically handed it off to her and then I walked away. And then later on that night, she pulled me aside when it was just the two of us. This is when we debrief at the end of the day. We debrief about all the things that happened. Usually when we're brushing our teeth and we're talking, she says, you know what happened today? I said, what was that? She said, here's what happened. When you got mad at me, then I took it out on Nate my 10-year-old. And when Nate got mad, he took it out on Zoe, my 5-year-old. She said it was like watching a chain reaction. You got mad at me, I got mad at him, he got mad at her, and by the end of the day, everybody was upset. And when she was telling me about this, I was listening to her and I was trying. She wasn't blaming me for anything. She was just matter-of-fact telling me that this, this was a chain reaction that I had set off by my own actions and my own words when I had got home from work. And when she told me, I was like, no way. I was all defensive. I said, no way you're blaming me for your actions. This is not on me. I didn't cause this. I didn't do this. And to which God listened and made a little note because a few months later it happened again. Except this time I was home the entire time. I think he wanted me to watch this whole thing happen. And it was awful to watch. It was like dominoes falling one after another. I was upset again. I sound like an angry person. I'm really not. But I just, I just want you to know that there are times as a pastor that I actually do get upset. And sometimes I'm not completely in control of where that goes. And so I was upset that morning and I handed it off to Mel. I got angry at her. And then she took it out again on Nate. And Nate, for whatever reason, five minutes later, just yelled at my daughter, Audrey, for who knows what. It was something stupid. And then ten minutes later, Nate went and he yelled at Zoe, my five-year-old. And one by one, the dominoes fell until everyone in the family was hit. 
And then when my daughter Zoe, the five-year-old, had nobody left to get angry with, she was at the bottom of the ladder, the bottom of the totem pole. She went and took it out on one of her dolls in her room. She went and yelled at an inanimate object, a, a doll that she had. She took it out and just lost it on one of her stuffed animals. And if this wasn't so serious, this would be so hilarious. This would be so funny if it wasn't my family, if it wasn't my kids. So I remember I sat there and I just looked around and I said, Lord, what have I done? What have I done? Because you know what? My wife was right. This was my fault. Because I handed it off and I started a chain reaction that didn't end until a stuffed animal paid the price for it. You see, anger is contagious. Anger is contagious. And if you are not careful with the words that you speak, it can affect a lot of people that you love. And most often, those are the ones that it affects most. And in the end, maybe a stuffed animal or two. Paul says, in your anger, when you get angry, be incredibly careful that you don't let it turn into sin. In those moments when you feel that emotion rise up in you, be very careful the words that you speak because you may end up hurting so many people that you care deeply about. And this is why it's so critical that you and I speak words of life, especially at home, because at home, that is where the ground is the most fertile. At home, that is where things grow. And if you scatter seeds like that at home, sometimes they will grow right in front of your very eyes like they did for me that day. Be careful of the words that you speak, especially in the confines of your own home because your family is listening. Speak life because that is where the ground is most fertile and that is where things grow. Now, of course, whenever you write a message on anger, God has to teach you about these things personally during the week. It's one of my personal favorite things about preaching is that God has a pre-lesson before you actually preach these things. And I can't tell you, there was two different times this week where I had to put into practice something that I preached last week, and I was in a situation where I just had to remove myself from that room. I had to extricate myself from the kitchen because I was about to say something that I would not be want to li- be liable for saying. So I left the kitchen. I sat there on my chair. I sat in my chair. I buried my head's in my hand and I said, quick to listen, slow to speak. Anybody else do this this week? Was I the only one? Quick to listen, slow to speak. Now, if you remember the verse we looked at last week, that was only the first half. If you remember those words that James wrote that we looked at last week, that was only the first half. And after James says we should be quick to listen and slow to speak, what is the very first thing he talks about next? Do you remember? The very first thing he says next It's about anger. When he says we should all be quick to listen and slow to speak, the very next thing he talks about in the same sentence is actually anger because he knows that ground zero for most of us is this emotion that comes through so strong and so hot-blooded. This is what he said. My dear brothers and sisters, everyone, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger, which is a key word here, man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You see, notice again that James doesn't say no anger. James doesn't say don't become angry. What does he say? Same thing as Paul, go slow. So what I want to do for you this morning is spend the rest of our time talking about three ways that you can fight back. I want to give you three tools, three tools that you can use in your life to protect you from speaking words that you don't want to speak. I want to give you three things to think of in that moment to protect you from sowing seed that you don't want to see and giving ground to the enemy where you don't want to give ground to the enemy. Three, three ways to stem the tide when you feel like you might say something that you'll soon regret. And if you can somehow learn to practice these things, if you can somehow learn to internalize them and maybe just remember them in that moment where your blood starts to boil, it will be such an ally for you in this thing that God has called us to. And the first one is this. Figure out why you're angry. In that moment, try and figure out exactly why you are angry. You see, all anger has a source. All anger has an underlying root. Something has happened to you or something is happening inside you that is sparking this emotion called anger. And and here's the funny thing. These emotions, they function a lot like the dashboard lights on your car. You've ever seen the check engine light come up on your vehicle before? You know that light that you ignore until something actually blows up? 
That light comes up, and it used to come up so often for my mom that she put a piece of electrical tape over top of it because she was sick of looking at it instead of actually dealing with it. And you all laugh, but most of you, most of you do some form of the same thing. And the funny thing is your emotions and my emotions, they function a lot like these warning lights on our dashboard. They tell us that there is something wrong, but they don't tell you exactly what. They tell you that something is going on inside, but they don't tell you exactly what. And the crazy thing is most of us deal with these lights the same way we deal with our emotions. We ignore them and we let it ride until something blows up or until something gives in. I think for a lot of us, unless you are a hyper-responsible vehicle owner, sometimes we just let it ride until something seizes up, something grinds to a halt, and all of a sudden we think, I probably should have fixed that a year ago. Same thing is true of your emotions. They are a signal. They are a light that goes on that says there is something going on inside your heart, and anger is exactly the same way. St. Augustine, a famous Christian writer and pastor from about 1,500 years ago, he used to say this. He used to say, emotions are like smoke from a fire. Emotions are like smoke from a fire. Emotions themselves are not the fire. They're just the smoke that lets you know there's a fire there, and it tells you that there is something wrong inside that you need to figure out how to deal with. And what I, want to, what I want to bring before you this morning is this, is if you can figure out what it is that is making you angry, you will have a much better chance of fighting back. Sometimes anger is a blocked goal. You had a goal and someone stepped right in front of it. Someone stood in the way of something that you wanted to do or somewhere you wanted to go. And, and I experience this all the time. Right now at home, we have a big goal. Do you know what it is? To get everything we own in boxes in four weeks. I have a goal. Is that a good goal? I have to be out of my house. I better have everything in boxes in four weeks. So we have a goal, my wife and I, everything we own in a box or in a bag in four weeks. And every time my kids are going crazy while I am trying to pack, what happens inside me? I get frustrated. I feel this welling up of strength of emotion. And do you know why I feel that way? Because someone has blocked my goal. I had a goal to pack. They are getting in the way of me packing, so I am frustrated, I am agitated, and I am upset. Now, let me ask you this. Is there anything wrong with my goal? Is there anything wrong with packing my house up in four weeks? Is there anything wrong with that, church? There's nothing wrong with that. Is there anything wrong with my kids just being kids and needing time and energy and love and attention from their parents? Is there anything wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. And yet, I feel angry. I feel upset. I feel agitated. Why? Not because anything has even done anything wrong, but because I have a goal and someone is standing in the way of it. They have blocked my goal. They have blocked my intention. They have blocked something that I want to do so this emotion wells up inside of me. Sometimes that emotion comes from someone who has taken something from you. Maybe someone has taken your reputation. Maybe someone has taken your time. Maybe someone has actually taken money from you and hasn't given it back and you have this well up of anger inside. They've wrongfully stolen something that matters to you. Sometimes they've done something inconsiderate, they've inconvenienced you, or they didn't think of how it would affect you. No matter what it is, here's what I want you to remember. If you can name it, then you have a better chance of taming it. If you can name it, instead of just feeling this fog of anger, if you can name why you were angry, and who has made you angry, and what it is they have taken from you, or what goal they are blocking, if you can name it, you will have a much better chance of taming it. The next time you feel your blood pressure rise, stop for a moment. I want to encourage you to think and ask yourself this question, why am I upset? You'd be amazed how many times we don't even ask ourselves that question, why am I angry? Because if you can figure out what it is, if you can name it and tame it, then you can deal with the fire instead of dealing with the smoke. You can deal with the fire instead of dealing with the smoke. Second piece of advice for you is this. It's coming from James. Don't feed it. This one is incredibly simple, but it is powerful. Don't feed it. Anger is like a fire, kind of like that emotion in that picture we're looking at. Anger feels like a fire inside you, doesn't it, sometimes, if it gets strong enough? Anger actually feels like a fire, and it works very much like a fire. And here's how it works. The more you feed it, the more it grows. The more you feed it, the more it grows. The more logs you throw on it, the more you blow at the base. The more you give it oxygen and material to combust with, the more you feed it, the more it grows. And here's the flip side of it, which is just as true. The more you starve it, the more it shrinks. If you're going to starve that fire of oxygen, eventually it's going to whittle down until it is just embers. And once those embers are starved of oxygen long enough, they will go completely cold and you will have a charcoal pit, not a fire pit. The more you feed it, the more it grows. The more you starve it, the more it shrinks. And Paul says this. He says, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Don't partner with it. 
Don't stew on it. Don't talk about it with all of your friends. Don't wake up in the morning and have it be the first thing on your head and the first word on your tongue. Don't brood on it and dwell on it and think of it first thing in the morning because every time you do one of these things, every time you partner with it, every time you join with it, you are actually feeding it and you are causing it to grow. Every time you invest yourself into it, you are feeding the fire, you are throwing on another log and you are blowing at the base of it. And Paul simply says this to you and me. He says, when the sun goes down, let it go down on your anger too. Don't feed it. Don't let your anger outlast the day. And often we've interpreted this passage as for husband and wives saying that you should resolve all your issues before you go to bed. And if you're capable of doing that, more power to you. But what this is really all about is not keeping a long burning anger that grows with inside of you. It's really all about starving the fire before it gets to blaze. Because if you let it get out of hand, if you let it get to blaze, that is when the devil wins. That is when the devil, as Paul says, gets a real estate foothold in your life. He gets a section of your life or your family or your home. And whenever you let that anger blaze, he has a little bit of territory that he plants his flag and he says, this is mine. And he can then mount an attack on the rest of your life. So Paul says, Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give him a foothold. Don't give him a square inch in your life because he will make your life miserable. Keep it short. Let it die out. Let it smolder and let it choke from lack of oxygen because if you want victory over anger, here is the answer. Don't feed it. Just let it die out. You can't control its initial genesis, but you can control whether you feed it. You can't control whether you feel it, but you can control whether you feed it. Starve it. Let it die out. Third thing is this. It's just two words. Go slow. Go slow. I told you last week that James is like the New Testament book of Proverbs. In a lot of ways it is because it is full of everyday wisdom for everyday situations that you can simply read and apply. Read and apply. And Proverbs talks over and over again about anger. And all over the place, the advice is the same. Do you know what his advice is? Go slow. I like how J.D. Greer says it. Proverbs doesn't say no anger. It says slow anger. It doesn't say don't get angry. It says go slow when you do. And let me read a few for you today. Proverbs 29. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. JD says the next time your friend calls you and says, I just want to vent, just say proceed, fool. (laughs) Right? A fool gives full vent. I'm not saying you can't talk with your family, but if you just let loose and you just open up the hinges, a fool gives full full vent to his anger, but a wise man holds it back. 1632, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. How many of you would like to be better than the mighty? He who is slow to anger is actually better than the mighty. If you want to be stronger than the strong men out there, practice the simple truth. Go slow when you are upset. Put an iron bar on your mouth until you are ready to speak because if you go slow, Proverbs tells you, you are stronger than the mighty. 29-22, an angry person stirs up conflict and a hot-tempered, read, quick-tempered person commits many sins. 19-11, it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. And if you listen to these passages over and over again, it's the same advice. Do you know what it is? Go slow. When you feel angry, don't feel like, I feel this, I must speak this. Go slow. Slow to speak, slow to think, slow to react. Now, here is my favorite piece of wisdom that I found this week in all of my research, and this is what it is. Do you know what slow to anger is in Hebrew? Do you know what the phrase that gets translated slow to anger is all throughout the Old Testament? You're going to love this. It is literally long in the nostrils. Isn't that good? Long in the nostrils. That may sound crazy to you, but you know why that's what it says? Because when you get angry, what is one of the telltale signs that someone is angry? It's their nostrils. They start to flare, right? If you never notice this, watch your mom when you've done something wrong or watch your wife when you've just done the thing that she has told you a hundred times not to do. You watch her face and the only place you have to look is right here because your nostrils will start to flare. Apparently, human beings can't control this mechanism. And the reason why Hebrews, or the reason why the Old Testament in Hebrew says this, he said long in the nostrils, as in it takes it a long time for this person to get upset. They are slow-tempered. They are stiff 
triggered. They are long-suffering. They are slow in the fuse. They are long in the nostrils. Isn't that great? The next time you are upset, just touch your nose and think, long in the nostrils. This is, Lord, give me a big nose today, Lord Jesus. And one of the best pieces of advice the Bible gives us on anger is simply this, is stop. Hold on. Wait a minute before you speak. Give yourself some time to process like we talked about last week. Go slow because you cannot take back the words that are going to come out of your mouth, so why not stop them before they ever leave? You cannot undo the damage that you will do if you let fly and let loose, but you can stop them before they ever go airborne if you simply do this. Go slow. Figure out why you're angry. Name it to tame it. Don't feed it. Let it choke. And go slow. I'll just close with the story. So I didn't mention this to many of you, but I had a very weird end to my vacation this summer. We had an amazing time away with family and friends into the cottage, but the Saturday night before I came back, two days before I came back to see you, I went two doors down on our street, and I went to pick up Nate from the neighbor's house where he often plays. He plays deep in their backyard. They've got some nice kids that my kids play with, and I went over there to see him and to bring him back home because it was time to go to bed. And when I walked into the driveway of this one place, I saw there sitting in the garage a strange dog that I had never seen before. I saw a dog tied up with a very long rope, and I just kind of assumed that it was a friend's dog or he was dog-sitting. I really didn't think about it too much until I went to the fence to call Nate over, and I yelled to him. I said, Nate, it's time to come home. And as soon as I'd said something, this dog from inside the garage rushed out at me. Now, I want to be really clear here. When I say dog, I don't mean chihuahua, okay? When I say dog, I don't mean put in your purse and go shopping kind of a canine dog. This was a king shepherd. Any of you seen a king shepherd before? Stood as high as my waist, probably about 150 pounds. He was two feet around the neck from one side to the other. I'm not kidding. So this dog rushes out at me, and I'm really, I love dogs. I'm used to dogs, and it looked like the same thing that dogs do when they're about to come to you and want you to pet them. They come and put their head under your hand, right? So I simply turned sideways when he came so he wouldn't knock me over and plow into me, and I simply waited for me to pet him, but he had very different ideas as to how the situation was going to unfold. This dog actually attacked me in my neighbor's driveway. In fact, I had no idea what was happening until he had already bit me. By the emergency room count, it was six times he bit me in the course of about a second and a half. You wouldn't think it can happen that fast. Trust me, it can. It can. Six lacerations, according to the doctor, that stitched me up. I hobbled home after this, still having no idea what happened. I went and showed Mel, and we had to makeshift a bandage out of fabric and tape because we didn't have band-aids big enough for what had just happened. I drove to the emergency room. I went and saw the doctor, and if it wasn't so serious, this part of the story would have actually been funny because I went to see the doctor, and he said, well, where did he bite you? And a little embarrassed, I said, "Uh, in my hindquarters. And he was like, oh. And I said, I know, right? It's just like out of a cartoon. So a lot of bandages, and a few stitches later, I went back home, and I tried to sleep on my side. For two weeks, I tried and could not sleep properly or sit properly for two full weeks. And when I came home, if you ever wanted to see Pastor Chris angry, when I came home, I was spitting nails. When I came home, I was just aflame. Rage would be a better word even than anger. Indignation, if you want to go biblical. This was some sort of indignation that was deep in my spirit. I was off the charts angry, and Mel had to listen to me blubber about it for two full weeks, because every time I sat down, I remembered what happened. Every time, if you saw me walking funny for the week, that was why. Every time I went to sleep and I couldn't turn over, I thought about this neighbor. I thought about this dog, and I thought about what he had taken from me, and I was angry. I was so angry, I went online and I researched dog bites and lawsuits and who I'd have to call to get this dog locked up. I wish I could blame it on the painkillers, but I didn't actually get any. The doctor didn't give me any. So every night when I went to bed, I stewed and I stewed and I stewed. Do you know what the worst part about this situation was? This was a neighbor who was new to our neighborhood. I'd been talking to him for a year and I had been sharing the gospel with him for a full year at this point. Isn't that the worst? You just want to get angry, and you know you can't. I had been telling him about Jesus, and I had been inviting him to come to church. And so after this all happened, I'm just locked down inside because I don't know what to say to the guy. 
I am so upset. And then he called me over one day and we went to talk because it was time for us to talk about some of the details. And I remember standing there on his porch and he was looking at me and I was looking at him and half of me just wanted to let loose about how much he had taken from me in this last two weeks, about how much he had stolen from me. And then the other half of me is like, Lord, I am going to ruin everything that you have done in his life so far this year. And he is never going to come back to church if I lose it on him. And so I'm standing there and he asks me, how are you doing? And we're both awkward and we both don't know what to say. I was just tongue-tied for a moment. And I, all I ended up saying at first was this because I couldn't, I couldn't come up with anything else to say. He said, how are you doing? And I said, well, I guess my days as a swimwear model are over. This is all, that's all I could come up with saying in that moment. I said, I guess my days as a swimmer model are over. And he looked at me and then he started to laugh. And in that moment, here's the truth. I was not willing to let the seeds of death come out of my mouth. I knew that much. I was not willing to let and give full vent to my anger with him. But you know what? I was so upset I couldn't get the seeds of life out either. Do you hear what I'm saying? I was so tongue-tied. I couldn't speak. It's okay. It's fine. God will take care of this. God will look out for us in both of this. It's not a problem. I couldn't get that out. But what I could do is stop the negative seeds from coming out and give God a chance to give me space in my heart to let the positive ones come. So I made a stupid joke. A stupid joke that broke the ice. A stupid joke that made it possible for both of us to come down a few notches and to relax just a little bit. And since then, our relationship is good. It's been restored. Our friendship is back. The chance for me to invite him back to church is still there. And all, all, all because by the grace of God, he was able to help me go slow. To stem the tide of those words that were on the tip of my tongue, those bitter words that were just itching and waiting to get out. To stem the tide and to give God a chance to let me speak life into his life instead of speak death. So here's what I want you to remember from all of this is that your words matter. Your words matter, especially when you are angry, especially when you are worked up. Remember Paul's advice to you in your anger, when you get angry, when you get worked up, don't let it lead you to sin because your words matter. Life and death hang in the balance as it did with my friend. So speak life. Speak life, and if you can't speak life, leave room until you can. Leave the situation until you can. Make a stupid joke until you can. But speak life in the people's lives around you. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Let's pray. Jesus, you understand this. Jesus, I'm not just saying that you understand this. You absolutely understand this because you have stood where we stand. You have put on flesh that we carry. You have been aggravated by the same people that aggravate us. Jesus, you know what this is like, and you can give us strength to speak life when everything hangs in the balance. God, my prayer for everyone in this room is that you would teach us how to speak, teach us to control our tongue, teach us to manage our hearts so that what comes out of our mouths is faithful and holy and good and pleasing to you. Make us a people who speak life. In Jesus' name, amen.